Good evening, God bless you. This is the Calvary Grace Evening Service, and it's a privilege to have you join us. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, bring your word to life. Let it touch the hearts and the minds of your people. Let them be strengthened through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. In the last service, we looked at the fact that Moses was not allowed to look on the face of God. But here in Colossians, we read this. He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness, all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He is the image of the invisible God. He is, uh, for by him all things were created, things in heaven, earth, invisible, 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 with the thrones, powers, authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is a, an expose written on Jesus. He is not only the creator Things were created that were created by him, were created for him. Why does the world exist? Because it suits Jesus. Why do I exist? Because it suits the Lord. And he is the visible representation of the Father. It is literally that he is the Father stamped out in human flesh. All things were created by him and for him, visible, invisible, whether thrones, powers, authorities, rulers, all things were created by him and for him. When you start reading visible and invisible thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities, almost always in your New Testament, the list refers to the demonic realm. All things were created by him and for him and he is before all things he is the balancing point of the Bible when you fly an aircraft you learn in flight school about a thing called the moment in arm and the moment in arm is that point of balance that the plane must have in order to fly right and when you come to the Old Testament, you start to read about various things that the Messiah must do and must have and must be. He must be Ben David. He must be Ben Yosef. He must heal the sick. He must raise the dead. There's so many things that he must do, all of which he has done to establish who he is. He is the balancing point of the Bible. When you come to the New Testament, it points back to Jesus. The Old Testament points forward to Jesus. And most specifically to the three and a half years of his ministry. 
These are the places that balance the weights of the Bible. And so you can see that if you wanted to distort the truth, you would need to start with the balancing point of the Bible. You would need to start with Jesus. And you would need to somehow distort who he is, what he has done. And in that way, you might have a hope of leading people astray. In John chapter 14, verse 5, we read this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you want to distort the gospel, where do you start? Well, I suspect that the enemy has tried to distort the gospel by attacking the personage and character and work and nature of Christ. He said, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Boy, what a linchpin that would be to pull. If you could pull Jesus out of the equation, nobody gets to the Father. Nobody would be saved. There are churches, incidentally, that pay very little attention to Jesus and a lot more attention to saints and to Mary. A lot of churches actually that pay more attention to the dead than the living. There are a number of denominations involved in this kind of thing. They have taken or attempted to take Jesus out of the equation, but he makes it very clear, nobody gets to the Father unless they come through me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read this, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which men may be saved. You know, your New Testament is very clear on this. There are some things in the New Testament that are not absolutely clear. And it can go either way. And that's why you have a lot of denominational splits and a lot of different denominational groups because they interpret certain aspects of the New Testament slightly differently from each other. Usually not enough to start a war, just enough to say you stand over there and I'll stand over here. But this is one of the things that is absolutely rock solid clear. Salvation is found in no one else. So if you're the devil, hopefully you're not, you're thinking to yourself, there's where I start. That's what I attack. That's what I go after. That's who I go after. I go after his character. I go after his nature. I go after his miracles. I go after his historicity. I'll tell people he never really existed. Because outside the Bible, there's not a huge amount of literature that talks about him. In fact, there is, by the way. But I'm, that's where I'm going to start. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, again, we just read another statement that makes it very clear. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. His preeminence is literally above all. There's 
nobody equal to him. There's nobody on his level. He's not one of many. He's not part of a pantheon of gods. He's not part of a group, except for the Trinity. He is unique, he is spectacular, he is the only connection between heaven and earth. There isn't a back door. There isn't a second route. I was asked a very interesting question the other day uh, by a lady and she asked it so lovely and, and kindly and she did not mean to be offensive in any way. But she said, what about other religions? She said, I think what's happening is that the other religions are worshiping the same God as we worship. They've just changed the names. And I had to tell her, no, that's not the case. They are not worshiping the same God. Otherwise, the theology would be the same. But when you're hearing from one holy book to kill the infidel, and another holy book that says, love those that do spitefully use you, you have to understand it's not the same mind behind them both. I prefer the one that's based in love and kindness and mercy and grace and forgiveness. That's the one that I cleave to. That's the one that has the stamp of Christ on it. For there is one man, pardon me, one God and one man, mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, a testimony given in its proper time. Again, we just keep coming on these statements. One man, one way, one avenue. Listen to this, John 10, 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come and he will go and find pasture. Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus is making a very interesting point. Well, not all his points aren't interesting, but this is a rather phenomenal point. He's saying that he is not only the gate, but he is the narrow gate. You know, there are many religions that teach that you're going to heaven your way, and we're going to heaven our way. Well, not according to the Bible. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads, or leads to destruction. There are so many isms and schisms and cults and groups out there, all promising to get you to a higher level, promising to open up channels and power points, energy points in your body, and so on. But none of them can get you to God except Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Why aren't all our churches jam-packed? Why isn't every seat in every Bible-believing church filled? Well, it is because small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There are all kinds of cultic attempts to get to God, all kinds of cultic ways and things that people do to try and reach God, please God, 
impress God that they might one day be with God. And yet the Bible is very clear. There is one way and one way only. And again, it is through this one way that the enemy has attempted to attack. You see, there are groups out there that have multiple gods, polytheists. Basically, you have three major systems of religion. And I'm not going to suggest they're all, there may be more. And some of them are a mixture. But you have polytheism. Those that worship multiple gods, they have different gods for different things. This was popular in Rome, it was popular in Greece, it was popular in Egypt, it's popular today in Hinduism. And I would suggest that there are Christian groups that hold very much similar opinions. And then you have pantheism. Pantheism is something that affects everybody, but most people don't know it. Pantheism rejects a personal God. Pantheism does not view God as a personal being, a being that has personhood, but rather a force, an energy. And pantheism views everything as being part of God. So you have polytheism where you have many individual gods. You have pantheism where you have a pantheon of gods. Well, by the way, you, you might have thought that that doesn't affect you. You ever heard of Mother Nature? Mother Nature comes directly out of pantheism. Assuming that there is a female force, a goddess force, Gaia also, by the name, that controls things like the weather, and that everything that exists is part of God. Therefore, you're God, and I'm God, and my car is God. So is my house and my front lawn, and no, you can't come over. That's pantheism. But then you have monotheism, the third form. And in that, we view God as one single individual, divided into three parts, yes, but one single individual. Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one God. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Both polytheism, multiple gods, and pantheism is everywhere. I used to think, well, it used to be a fact that it was never the case. And I would never see it. But now we have temples everywhere to various gods, various religions. There is one not so far from us in a town out by our airport that has a massive golden Buddha. That's just one. That's just one. There, there are so many of these groups and cults that appeals to people. There are people that just don't receive, don't like the Christian message. And when you come to them and say, listen, you must be born again. Why? Because you need to repent for your sins. Why? I can meditate them away. I can sit there and vegetate and everything, you know, uh, in my mind. I can change it all in my mind. And I can reach peace in my mind. Well, that's going to work really well when you're dead. I don't think. There is a broad path that leads to destruction. And whatever flavor you like, they've got your flavor. 
They've got what you want. And then you say, you must come to Christ. And I say, well, if it's a polytheist, they'll come along and say, well, okay, we'll come to Christ. Uh, we've got a bunch of gods. What's one more? Until you say to them, well, all the other gods have to go. There can only be one. Now their heckles get up. And the attitude now is, you're a bigot. We'll take your gods or your God. Why won't you accept our gods? And in human logic, you can see where they're coming from. You can see how on a human level, it makes sense. But you see, if you've come to Christ, you have come to the one avenue that takes you directly to God, not based on your behavior, not based on your works, but based on what you believe and based on his finished work. And so we have entered through the narrow gate, but that broad gate is still out there and millions and millions and millions, perhaps to the billions, are trying to get in through the broad gate. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In 2 Corinthians 11, we read something which most people are a little surprised at. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1, I hope you put up with a little of my foolishness, that's Paul speaking, but you're already doing that. I, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. First of all, he's making it very clear that his message is not a polytheistic message. His message is not a pantheistic message but it's a monotheistic message and he has promised us to Christ. And his hope is that he might present us as a pure virgin, not as those that are stigonistic and have a little of this and a little of that and a little of the next thing, all thrown in together, but that our faith in him might be pure. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds might somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I grew up in a time when Christians didn't drink. It just didn't happen. They didn't smoke. They didn't drink. And they attended church every week. And this was just what I might consider and call the bare minimum. And if you saw somebody in a restaurant with a drink in their hand, you knew right off they were not Christians. If you saw them smoking, you knew right off they were not Christians. All of that has changed. Now it's become very hard to tell the sheep from the goats. Now, what we've learned to do is to water down our faith. He said, I'm concerned that just as Eve was led astray, that somehow you might be led astray from your pure devotion. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or you receive a different spirit from the one you receive, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easy enough. You don't even question it. When somebody knocks on the door and says, I'd like to hold a Bible study. I am from the Watchtower. Bible Society. All we hear is Bible. And by the way, what you need to do with those people is bring them in. Offer them refreshments, be gracious, be kind, and preach the gospel. 
Or you might get a knock on your door from somebody else that wears a white shirt and a black tie and says, hi, I'm from the church of the Latter-day Saints. Again, do not slam the door. Be gracious and be kind. You might wonder why. I'll tell you why. It messes with their theology. They are taught that you are the most horrible people on the face of the earth and that you reject them and they get rewards when you reject them. And so when you accept them and bring them in, but do not accept their gospel, it changes their hearts. It affects them. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or you receive a different spirit from the one you received or a different gospel from the one that you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. He's warning us and telling us that there are people wandering around preaching different versions of the gospel. And his point here is, don't put up with it. Stay with the pure truth of the Bible. Don't let somebody hoodwink your faith and drag you aside into some cultic way of thinking. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am astonished that you so quickly deserted the one that called you by his gra by grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. What they are doing here, by the way, in, in Galatia, is they're turning to a gospel that is part by faith and part by works, which is really no gospel at all. You've kicked the teeth out of the gospel. You've stripped it of its power. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. This is going on in the first century. How much more do you think has gone on since then? But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. That is the Greek word anathematized, damned. You see, when you hear the story of the Mormons, it's all based on angelic appearances to Joseph Smith. Exactly as Paul writes here and warns against. Just about every pineapple you eat puts money into the Mormon church. There are many hotels, worldwide chains, all money for the Mormon church. As we have now already said, and now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. He's saying, listen, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think. I'm not trying to please them. I'm trying to please Jesus. He is the center. He is the balance point. He's the moment in arm. He is the fulcrum. He's what it's all about. And he said, I want you to please Jesus. In Matthew 24, verse 3, we read this. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him and said, uh, uh, privately, and said, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. I had a person work for me some years ago who was a Baha'i. And uh, 
this person tried very hard to get my wife and I to join the Baha'i, even to the point of having us over to dinner with ex-Christians who had become Baha'i. And the argument is, you don't have to leave Christianity. You just bring it along. It's all good. Well, who do you worship? We worship the glory of God, Baha'u'llah. And his prophet's name is Bob. Well, that appealed to me. I rather like the name Bob. But I don't think I'm going to be worshiping Bob or Baha'u'llah. First of all, it's Allah, not Jehovah. But secondly, he says this, many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ, not Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Now we know many came into Israel throughout the centuries claiming to be the Messiah. They have a Rebbe that was, well, died just a while ago that claimed to be the Messiah. Of course, he's now passed. They believe he's not passed, that he's just hiding. Though the detractors will tell you he's dead. Many will come claiming to be the Christ. Well, who is Baha'u'llah? Well, Baha'u'llah is the latest incarnation of the Christ spirit. And they will work you through the historical roots of all of these pagan religions, saying it's the same spirit, it's the same individual, it's the same messianic individual all the way through. And one of his incarnations was as Jesus. Exactly as Jesus said they would. Well, first of all, if that's the case, then I have a problem with his earlier incarnations were teaching polytheism, and the earlier, earlier ones were teaching pantheism, and Jesus taught monotheism. So if it's all the same guy, God is very confused. And if God is that confused, we have worse problems. In the book of Luke, Verse 21, he says, watch out that you are not deceived for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. In Mark chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. Remember, broad is the path that leads to destruction. Verse 22, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles and deceive even the elect if that were possible. Be on your guard. For I have told you everything ahead of time. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will, will, will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the splendor of his coming. By the way, I just like that. Before he describes the lawless one, the Antichrist, he's going to just tell you when Jesus comes, he's just going to... And the glory of his coming is going to be so spectacular. It'll make anything the Antichrist look, have look like a toy. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. I want you to know right off, I believe that we are seeing that now. There are miracles being done in the cults. There are miracles being done by the occult. There are miracles happening amongst pantheists and polytheists. And all of a sudden, you're no longer a nut if you believe in UFOs. What's going on there? Could it be that something lands on the White House lawn and steps out and says, we have the answers and leads the world 
further astray. First of all, I want you to know that while I believe these things exist and are happening and what people are seeing is real, I believe them to be demonic and I believe them to be demons. I think this is just the same group that was around from the beginning of time, that was around in Genesis 6. They were wiped out, but they came back again in the Old Testament. And I believe this is the same group doing the same nonsense. <coughs> Excuse me. For this reason, God sends them powerful delusions so that they will believe the lie. The world will accept it. The world will go after it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed in the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. In John, 1 John chapter 4, we read this. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits and see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard and is coming and is even now already in the world. He's writing this in about 90 AD, and he's telling you that spirit is already here. Before I was the pastor of this church, there was a lady that came and approached the pastor of that time. I'm not going to tell you who he was because he's my brother. And she asked if she could speak because she was a minister. And he thought it over and said, yeah, okay. You, you got you got ministerial papers and uh, you know we've not heard anything dreadful about you that's that's great go ahead and she got up and she began to speak and the first half of the sermon was all about Jesus and walking as he walked and the second half of the sermon was all about the fact that he was not real. That he was a great idea and an ideal that we should live up to, but not a real person. And I pulled my brother aside and said, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And that person was not permitted ever to speak again. But that's exactly what the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians 11, we read this. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen masquerading as apostles of Christ. For no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then that his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. They'll come as angels of light. They'll come with messages of light. Frequently, they actually use that kind of term terminology. One lady, I, 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 I saw her book, it was called Dancing in the Light. It was all about channeling and being in touch with other spirits and so on. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we read, It was he that gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness in Christ. Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. In other words, what you have in the church is designed to prevent you from going astray, being pulled by the deceitful scheming of these cults and these groups, and these teachings. 
So many times people, I, I, I've seen this all through my career in the ministry, are so impressed with somebody's credentials, who they preach for, how big their church is, how many years they've been preaching, that they never stop to question what they're being told. They never go back to the word and go, well, is that really what it says? I believe you absolutely should. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. For in him the whole body is joined together and held by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, each uh, as each part does its work. In Matthew chapter 7, again, again, again we read, Verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come at you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you'll recognize them. People, uh, don't, uh, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree, bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. There are many out there driving out demons. There are many out there prophesying in the name. And one day they'll stand before God and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? But he has warned us, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. And the key to watch out for is those that go after Jesus. Those that alter his divinity, that alter his status, that make him one in a long line of incarnations, or those that view him as a good teacher, but not God. So many variations, I could be here all day but it's important to remember this. We are monotheists. We believe in Jesus. We believe, as Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He is the center and the balancing point of your Bible and should be the center of your faith. Do not accept any substitute. Do not accept any alternative. Even if an angel from heaven should come to you with another message, which, by the way, not only knocks out Mormonism, it would also knock out Islam. Or if somebody claiming to be an alien with real technological answers to the world's problems. Don't be fooled. You know who it is. You know what it is. Serve Jesus and him alone. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that as this word has gone out, that it'll fall not on deaf ears, but on hearing ears. And that from this will come a harvest of good. Lord, we recognize Jesus as the center, the author, the finisher of our faith. We recognize him as all-powerful, as the narrow gate and the narrow path. 
and it's sad, but few there are that find that. I pray that people would not be pulled astray or led astray into various doctrines that divide and bring harm, but that they would join together in love and follow you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.